This week on the Linux Action Show, we get the insider scoop on the OpenSUSE build service and SUSE Studio. Find out how these two services alone could change the landscape of Linux forever. Then we bust out an Android app pick so rad it just might help you run from the cops. Then we wrap up our news segment with the top five features of Ubuntu 10.10, .10, plus so much more. Oh, this week on the Linux Action Show. And welcome to the Linux Action Show Season 12, Episode 10, the season finale of, ep of Season 12, Episode... Right. Right. Did I get that? Yep. Yes. I'm Brian. Chris. Hey there, Brian. India's $35 Linux tablet. Well, it runs Linux. It sure as heck Check this little thing out. I got I to gotta make a disclaimer here. It is a prototype, Brian, but it is yeah. a functional prototype that they demoed. Um, they uh, revealed the prototype on July 22nd at a public event. They uh, say it will have a 7-inch color touchscreen, 2 gigabytes of storage, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, uh, going to run either Android or some other distro of Linux. Get ready for this, dude. They eventually want to get the price down to like 20 bucks and then down to 10 bucks. Yeah. They say one laptop per child, yeah. 100 bucks, please. Dude. Isn't that crazy? Dude. I mean, first of all, if they can pull off a $35 touchscreen Linux tablet. All by itself. Holy crap. Every one for every room of the house. Every every room of the house. And seriously, and if it gets down to below 20 bucks, at that point you accidentally drop it. Do I want to bend over and pick it up? <laughs> ah. You do, but that's just because you want to be able to have something because you're probably walking to the well, bathroom. Yeah, just because you know it's either that or you have to walk another ten feet to get the other back right, that you right. had sitting right. over on the shelf. <laughs> it's you know, I it's that's awesome. At this point, like it's hard to tell from the pictures how good the screen is. The right. screen looks all washed out, but then again, it's a photo taken from a yeah, distance it's in, hard in sunlight. To say, but... Hard to say. Um, you know, the the form factor looks very generic, but honestly, I like the look of the form factor of it better than I like like you know a lot of the tablets that are out there mm -hmm, right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't look too fancy. It's just this brick with a screen and some buttons, and I like that. Well, and it's That's interesting too because it. you uh, they say it's going to have an ARM processor in it and uh, maybe even the potential of a low end really low end webcam um That's also awesome. the power consumption of 2 watts I mean, the stuff they can pull <laughs> off with linux is just so cool uh, i was Holy listening moly. i was listening to a, awesome. to a high end video production uh, guy and he was talking about how they're building uh, some hardware green screening that is actually just going to be software inside a box yeah and they wanted to go with mac os 10 because their whole production from top to bottom is all the apple final cut suite which a lot of shops his size are but he said when it came down to actually building hardware they tried to do it on a mac and it was just completely unfeasible like, from a cost no standpoint way. from a customized so so this all mac shop is going to go linux same thing these guys are doing because when you when you have the total flexibility and freedom of modifying a free operating system you completely eliminate that cost yes i mean there's the cost of customization but there's so many things already out there ready to use and and, and so many people who specialize in in customizing linux of various types to fit onto these these and devices plus, and it's just you just go not? you just go linux and you make headlines and you get guys like us talking about your new product um, so I, I think it's really cool, and uh, I'm it's I'm gonna follow it. Incredibly cool. I, I see. For me, I've been I have been jonesing hard for a great portable comic book reader. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you I know? can see that a seven inch screen might not be too bad. A seven -inch you have to get it just right though, because it's not it gonna fit right. everything. Yeah, it's not gonna fit everything. Well, like right now, I use my little my little tablet. Yep. yep. You know, but my little tablet's a little a little like what half an inch screen. It's super tiny. So you could uh, probably do one cell at a time, right? In the well, comic? no, no. What you, what I can do what, on this tablet, if you, if you set it, uh, kind of laid on a side so it's landscape, and you set it so it fits to width, you have to scroll up and down, but you can still. Well, that's it okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where it's, you know, where it, what matters really almost more than the size is the actual resolution, right? Because you like, want that picture artwork to be like vibrant. on the bigger tablets, like like <clears throat> look at the iPad. The iPad's got the size enough. But right. its resolution isn't very good. Yeah. So when you blow up a comic book that uh, that size, you can't read the fine text. You're not. Yeah. You have to actually you zoom still way zoom. in still in zoom. order to do it. Whereas on this, it looks like the resolution would be enough to where you you could Google That'd be pretty scroll, cool, but you'd still you'd still be able to read it. That would be really neat. And I, I'd like that for thirty five bucks. I could have a comic book reader 
in my bathroom. Yeah. A comic book reader. In the kitchen. Over over the sink in my bathroom. On each side of the bed. Uh, on each side of the bed. In the shower. Seriously, I could buy like <laughs> seven of them for like 200 I know. some dollars. I know. Which is cheaper than an iPad. And at that point... That's just ridiculous. I, know, I don't dude. care how slow it is. I can multitask by simply holding multiple <laughs> tablets. <laughs> just That's freaking awesome. awesome. multitasking. That's what I'm saying. Hey, you know what we should talk about before we go too much further? we got a huge no, show. What, what should we talk about? I've got a really cool Android pick. But first, I yeah. wanted to say holla to the buddies over at GoDads.com. GoDaddy.com, Brian. Well, what do you have for me? That's interesting that you bring this up because this episode of the Linux Action Show, the season finale of the this season of the Linux Action Show, is sponsored by GoDaddy.com. The world's largest web host and domain name registrar starting at less than five dollars per month web hosting from godaddy.com includes 99 percent uptime 99.9 yeah, excuse buddy. me i i you gotta get I, all those nines i, I gypped them on 0.9 percent and that's not cool because that 0.9 percent means something yeah uh that's 24 by 7 support support and free access to godaddy hosting connection the place to quickly install like tons it says 50 free applications here but i think it's like a million it's now. way more than 50, uh wordpress so you can just like one click install wordpress you're like i want a wordpress site I get this thing. I go and oh, go into the web hosting GoDaddy connection, whatever thing it's called. Blick, click, blick, click, blick, click. It's not Metropolis WordPress. anymore, Brian. It used to be Metropolis. Now it's web hosting ho- connection. Hosting connection. Anyway, ten percent Linux, twenty percent Linux twenty. You know this is kind of funny, but I didn't realize how many different types of domain names there were until I went over to GoDaddy's website. Start scrolling down. Did you know there's a dot yeah. VG? I didn't a dot .idv .tw. I wanted dot .idv Jupiter Broadcasting dot .idv dot .idv dot .tw. And you know what? If I wanted to do it's that, awesome. I would just buy the domain on my awesome GoDaddy Android app, which I will now tell you my Android pick of the week. So thank you to GoDaddy for their sponsorship of awesome the Linux Action Show. Now, the app I want to talk about today is one of these apps. You'd be like, that just sounds like a dumb thing to have, and it's called Scanner Radio. There's a couple of different of these types of applications in the Android marketplace, but Scanner Radio is like the other ones. It lets you tune in to police uh, radio broadcasts, like in, like the police in a car or fire or yep. aid cars, because um, a lot of them now stream that over the internet. Yeah. So That's this lets cool. you say, hey, what's near me? Uh, find what's near me. So it, it uh, hits the GPS. And the one thing I like about scanner radio is it hits the GPS a lot faster than a lot of the other apps do. Um, so then it tells you, it breaks it down into category. You see less than 25 miles away, 25 plus, things like that. And then... Uh, <clears throat> You choose the one you want. It goes in there and it uh, will it'll buffer the stream and play it. It also offers oh a uh, fire. yeah. It also offers a host of uh, like DVR type. Unable functions. to connect. Yeah, my it has a chat. Bad. It has a chat for each one too. Oh, that's that's twistedly that's weird. Weird, right? That's super weird. So, here's so you where can, I can tune see in that. to like people getting pulled over and chat about. Yeah, them. exactly. That's so not that cool. sucker just got busted. But also, Dude. here's where I, here's where I actually use it. Every now and then, I fire the sucker up if I hear sirens around my house and I want to know what's going on. Why are there like why is there like a police brigade like down the street? Yeah. Uh, but what's actually more useful is when I'm driving down the street and there's a traffic incident. I fire this sucker up. I hit nearest near me, so I get the cops that are in the area behind sure, around me. Sure, sure. And I get to listen to what the traffic incident is. So I know exactly, so without even having to listen to the radio broadcast, I know exactly where the accident's at and how serious it is. So then, based on kind of experience, I know, oh man, that's going to be a major blockage. I need to get the F around that. Or maybe it's going to be a minor thing, so I'll just stick it out. Uh, that is actually, for somebody who drives as much as I do for my job. That's awesome. It's really nice. That's pretty cool. So, uh, and it also, of course, runs in, see, now it is actually playing in the background. It runs in the background, um, and it can, it can run in streaming mode, or it can run in monitoring mode, where it can listen for emergency situations around you based on the flag, and then it'll alert you. Really? It's pretty neat. So, That's check it out. That's cool. I'll have a link in the show notes. It is Scanner Radio. And it's free. Uh, yeah, and I've tried a couple of different ones. It's totally free. Um, I like the other ones, too. I'm trying to remember what the other one was called, but... Um, Scanner something, and it's a good app too. So if you've already got it, don't worry about it too much. But I, I like, I really like Scanner Radio. Give it a check; you'll like it. Fancy. Hey, before we go into the news, we should mention uh, Jupiter Knight and Brian Lunduk's Jupiter Files are rocking every day. Every day. So go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com if you want to check out those new shows. They're daily shows. Yeah, and if you want to tune in live, it's jupiterbroadcasting.com slash live. Uh, see, uh, the uh, Jupiter Files is every day, 7 a.m. Pacific time, and or every day, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Pacific right. time. And when's the uh, Jupiter at night? 9 p.m., and it is Monday through Thursday. Fancy. And uh, it's at the same place, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash live, which, incidentally, is also the same place you could watch the Linux Action Show live what? Sunday mornings at which 10 a.m. Which a lot of people are doing right now. Yep. 
And we should say that all that whenever we talk about times, because we're really bad at time math, we're talking Pacific. It's Pacific time. It's we're talking Pacific daylight Seattle right now. time. Yeah. yeah. Hey Brian, I, I don't even know Pacific, like PDT, PST, whatever. I don't. We're know in the, the we're in the PDT even. right now. Uh, whatever. It's Pacific. It's and Seattle then you have Pacific time. nighttime and Pacific it's Seattle daylight. time, which I hear is similar to Los Angeles and San Francisco time. Yeah. These are the only bits I know, and I don't know that for for a fact. I think there might be a quantum slip because when I because sure. when I travel, I just reset all my clocks because I don't know. So if I go down to LA, I'm like, what mm-hmm. time is it? I don't know. I have to look at a clock and reset everything. I go. Uh, what I do is I walk out into the sun. And then, depending on where the sun's at, I sort of position my head, and then however the sun reflects off the part in my hair onto the ground, I know what time it is. And that's really the only time that I care about. <laughs> you are retarded. <laughs> you are a retarded, retarded man. All right, Brian. Hey, Chris. Let's do the news. I want to do the news right now. All right? <laughs> What's new in the news this week? Oh, all right, Brian. Our cop I story. Liked the little thing. You. That was a good little shake. It's a new one, right? I, like you. I think in 120 before, episodes, yeah. I don't think I've ever done I'm that. I'm amazed before. that you haven't ever done that before. I got every now and then introduce I am a new blown one. Blown away right now. I thought we'd do our top news story. This is a groundbreaking episode <laughs> of the Linux Action Show. <laughs> Changed That's everything. Just fantastic. I thought I would. Uh, the top story I thought would be more of an update on a important long term open source issue, and that is the uh, little progress update here on WebM, also known as VP8. Also known as WebM. You guys remember the Google I.O. conference where Google uh, announced or their... Or WeBum. WeBum, yeah. Yeah, the WeBum update. They announced the WeBum uh, codec, and uh, it's essentially going to be the open source replacement for H.264s. It's the answer to H.264's question, sort of the successor to Og Theor in terms of open source yep. codecs. But one of the issues that we, you might notice, the Linux Action Show here, still releases in Og Theor, not WebM. Correct, sir. Um, and one of the problems with that is the initial implementation from Google, the encoder and decoder were very, very, very slow. Very slow. I mean, to encode this episode of Linux Action Show would be like a 24-hour process. Way too slow. I'm going to be honest. It's too long. That too long, Brian. It's too long. It's too long. So uh, you might. I don't actually don't think we did cover this story, but uh, Jason Gart Glazer. I don't know if I'm getting the pronunciation of his name right, but there's he, no way you're pronouncing no. his name right. But if his you, name could be Tom Smith, and you'd mispronounce it. At this I, I like Glazer though because it makes me think of donuts. I'm gonna go with Tom Glacier because I feel like he's awesome and he's got like one of those yeah. ice pick things yeah. where he climbs things and he's always holding it. And glaciers and like can move stuff way. as they move. Um, so he is the developer. Whatever, glaciers don't move. Uh, at least the primary developer is my understanding between the X6, the X264. That's the open source implementation of H.264. Boy, I'm I'm throwing a lot of word soup at you guys, but hang with me for a second because I'm getting to a good point. Yeah, okay. Uh, he makes the X264 implementation. He took a look at WebM and he said, ah, oh, this is this. This decoder and encoder are junk. This is just junk. So wh- instead of being a pissy little brat, he uh, <laughs> well, because that's a lot of times what happens, right? He yeah. went over and he didn't he, just whine. He he dove in. He dove in. I yeah. love that. He teamed up with Ronald. Uh, oh boy, Bajote, uh and David Conard. Conard. Wait, wait, I don't wait. know. Conrad. Conrad. Wait, let's go with Conrad. Spell, spell Bajote. Um, Bajute. Spell it. B U L. Oh, I didn't see the L. I had it zoomed out. B L U T J E. Bolt. And, Bolt J. And and David Conrad and they've come up with a community Look implementation. You Conrad like that. Awesome. And they uh, they came up with a free decoder built into FFmpeg. They're calling it V or FFVP8. Reason why you guys need to care about this is this is actually substantially faster than the one Google's released so far. I mean, we're talking oh yeah massive speed of improvements, which is key for WebM to take off, and they haven't even necessarily begun to optimize it yet. They just moved their implementation over on top of FFmpeg, got a huge increase. Surprisingly, one of the biggest increases in performance without a single code optimization for the chip is the Atom processor in netbooks. What? Yeah. Very awesome. Uh, so with, with this kind of with this kind of progress Rad. and oh I should mention Rad. they weren't screwing around either. They were doing tests of 1080p clips, which is Specifically, where I saw as soon as you hit HD with WebM, that's where Ooh, I was seeing. Yeah, issues. It, it tanks. It was tanking, and yeah. so I don't know. I'm I'm really getting I'm really getting more and more excited about with hey, if we about get, WebM. If we can get the WebM implementation up there and it's actually like rocking, I'm I'm right? all on board. I think so too. Uh, and I would love I to start being able to tied to any one format. I don't care what it is, but whatever if it, works, if it rocks. Yeah, and everyone can use it on their machines, whether it be Linux or whatever the other ones are. Great. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, I'm I'm excited. I'm looking forward to a lot of the online streaming sites getting support. A lot of those sites like YouTube and Archive.org and yep. a lot of other backends, a lot, almost all the other sites on the backend are using Linux and FFmpeg to transcode all of their videos. They are. So good FFmpeg support is a key, key, key element in getting WebM adoption going. You bet. So if WebM takes off, that's huge for the Linux desktop, and we just got a major first step in that direction. That's very awesome. So Rad. there's your WebM, WebM update. That or is your, your WebM update your WebM, of the week. Your WebM update, because we haven't talked about it in a little while. The next thing we want to talk about is, I haven't done this for a while, uh, a community member of the Linux Action Show. He's watching the live stream right now, and he's been a follower for a little while. Say what? Uh, he started up a project. It's called Client Pie, and it's a project management uh, site. It's really cool Pi looking. so much. I know, right? And uh, he he built it all on top of open source technology, so it's really great for that. Pumpkin pie. And you know what else he did? Like Blackberry Pie. He used uh, he used our uh, GoDaddy promo code to register his domain. Ugh. He used our code Linux. So you got to respect that. You know what you could do? So clientpie.com. dot com with our with our promo code. You could make a like a cherry pie for Brian dot com yeah. website. And would you just sell cherry pies to Brian, or just come up with ways to make donations think, to yeah, deliver I think pies? It's to donations Brian? to deliver yeah. cherry pies to Brian. The charity pie drive. Charity pie drive for Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Dot, dot com, dot ITV, dot edu. <laughs> dot, dot, what was I saying earlier? Dot, ITGV, dot ITV, WK. Yeah. So, the, buy them all. Use the like, promo buy code Linux. all of them. <laughs> It'll be like the only website in the world that has every domain name, and it's Man. it's Charity Pie Drive for Brian, dot whatever. Yep, yep. So God, check that's out. That's a great idea. Go uh, go over to clientpie.com. GoDaddy would be thrilled. Yeah. Wait, what were we talking about? Client Pie, that? but... Client pie? That's okay. All right. That sounds good, too. Now, we have got... Oh, uh, my clients don't deserve pies. I deserve pies. We have got ourselves a heck of an Open SUSE episode today. A big one. Huge one. And I, I don't want to put everyone off. I know I know a lot of you out there running running Ubuntu. I know a lot of you, a lot of Debian, a lot of Mandriva, a lot of Fedora. Of well, one or two, because I don't think many people use that anymore. Um, uh, users out there. Uh, but but stay... stay Stay tuned to this uh, because OpenSUSE and the, the SUSE team in general and the guys at Novell, the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole canopy that envelopes that which is the SUSE world Whoa. are doing a lot of really cool things. Yeah. And uh, we, we think it really needs some attention because there's oddly not a lot of attention on a few of these topics, which is weird considering how interesting they are. So uh, I they're, agree. they're, they're Function, pieces of functionality that that honestly, I don't think it's going to be long before you start seeing Ubuntu and a few others start to try and copy, replicate. So or just uh, let's, use. So let's, really. yeah, honestly, they should really just utilize it. Uh, but we're going to talk about those, uh, and that's uh, that's all coming up. But first, let's talk about Ubuntu. That way, the show's balanced. Yeah, uh, and it's a good time in the development life cycle, I think, right now, to talk about some of the features that are coming up in Ubuntu ten ten, the next version. Yes, sir. Uh, a couple of things on this list grab my attention. Anything grab your fancy off the top of your head? Um, you know, well, well let's let's kind of go down go down the, list, the list to start with. I've got a couple of things that are that I'm kind of curious about. In now, general, I got to imagine the software center enhancements are probably up there for you as a software maker. Th that that's first and foremost for me, and they've they've got some enhancements here, um, like better search. Better search is great. Um, I like that. Uh, better search is good. Uh, improved dependency display. That's nice. I mean, it already you know uses apt on the back end yeah, to install it. everything, so it does really well. But it, I think they're basically going to make it so it shows what the dependencies are a little I better before thing, you start installing. One thing they'll be adding to the marketplace, it looks like, which is an interesting idea, is a place to find add-ons. Applications. There's more and more applications like Chromium, Firefox, shoot, a lot of the chat programs, email programs, all have these extensions yeah. and add ons. And now they're going to have featured sections in the marketplace to That's find them. That's very those. cool. So you go yeah. to one spot, Firefox extensions. Right. That's pretty cool. Now, the one thing that I'm not seeing a lot of information on. Is purchasing software the sales through mm -hmm. uh, uh, through through the the store here, and I'm I'm not seeing that. Yeah, I've and heard some mixed stuff on that so far. Ubuntu 10.10 is supposed to be the time when we get that. The roadmap is the last update I saw says paid that apps. That's paid apps is is when this comes, so that uh, third party developers like myself would be able to sell applications through the uh, through the application center here and. But jam, living Kablamo on your screen. Awesome. I think I've but heard I'm not seeing that, and I, and I put this firmly, everyone, in the rumor column. I think the last what I what I recall reading was uh, we're going to have 
Canonical selected paid apps in 1010s rolled out of the store. So it's basically limited. Limited. But then they're going to be building on the back end an infrastructure for user-submitted paid apps to be rolled out in a future update or in the next Ubuntu release. So, hey, uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Canonical, uh, send me an email. I want more information. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Uh, because honestly, I think this is a big deal, dude. If you could get in there when it's only a few selected apps, that could be big. Well, well I, not not just not just for me. I mean, I'd like that. I mean, I know. for me, I want that. Uh, but but even more importantly, it's going to be a big news item. Yeah. Like everyone goes around talking about app stores. Like like you remember when when Sun was just had a rumor that they were going to have a Java app store. Do you remember mm-hmm. that? I do. Nothing really came of that. Nope. That was just that was just fluff. Like like that have been air huge for Java. Out of nowhere. But that'd have been huge. But just the just the mere mention uh-huh. of Java App Store, everyone was like, say what? Yeah, what? App Store? It was like on it was on CNN for a day. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's a huge news item. If Ubuntu had a nice I agree. app store, yeah. even if it wasn't that robust, it was just an app store, that's gonna drive a lot of mind share. People are gonna be reporting on that, you know. Gizmodo will report on it, even you know what I mean. It's yeah, like Lifehacker will have a big giant. Oh, story absolutely, about absolutely. It. All the websites, the, the register will cover it, and probably will dog on it because register seems to hate Linux nowadays. Well, and we've been talking about how we think that the you know the future differentiator between Linux distributions is going to be add-on software and services, yeah. um, like the Software Center, but also you know. Uh, we're getting, we're seeing, I think, some major changes and improvements in the Ubuntu uh, syncing service, Ubuntu One. Yep. Uh, one of the things they're going to be rolling into it is now they're going to call it OneConf. <laughs> and, and I got to say, my understanding of all of what OneConf will encompass is a little early, a little shaky. Still, I'm going to. This yeah. is definitely. This is for sure one of the things I'll be checking out when I beta test. Uh, but the idea is OneConf will allow users to share their Ubuntu configurations between multiple machines. Um, and they, when they say that, they mean like <gasps> settings, applications. So, so theoretically, if you install, let's say, um, Inkscape. You install Inkscape from, from the software center. It can be added to your OneConf li- list of installed applications. And you can have that sync... Yeah. To your other and like a laptop other, and a desktop systems. or yeah, netbook. So, so the same versions, cool. the same applications can be running across all of your different machines if you turn that and on. You and I that's so cool. have mentioned that we kind of hack a, a rough version of this through Dropbox or Ubuntu One Now where we simlink yep. our configuration files. But this Yeah. Man, I mean, I, I'm still using Dropbox for my for my online storage, mm-hmm. but Honestly, the I mean, because I I mostly use Ubuntu. Right, you've got now. Ubuntu One is going to have music sync, so all your yep. purchased music will sync between all your machines. And the One Comp, so all my all my config apps, and apps will be config and, and, apps. and what's great is they're not storing the apps in your Ubuntu One storage. My understanding is hmm. they are descriptors and links to the software store. So you will load up the software store. St- software store it will import essentially a list of your apps and then deploy them to your machine, Perfect. which means you get the latest version in the repo. And you get uh, the savings of your Ubuntu One storage sync. So, right. uh, storage. And, and your application settings. So if you set up a bunch of settings that's understood by yep. OneConf, that, that, that OneConf is really so awesome. to understand, you can sync all those across. I, I love that. Right. Uh, along, uh, that kind of matches with this. So because you're going to be able to get these applications pushed to your machine, essentially, one of the things that they'll be working on, no, I don't believe it'll be fully done for 10.10, but they're going to be working on post-release application delivery. We're not talking like security updates, you know how like oh, you keep getting Firefox yeah. point updates. Let's be clear about what this is. This is like a whole new ver- if a whole new version of Firefox came out. Like after 1010 comes out, if, ver- if Firefox 4 stable ships, they'll be able to strip line it, st- streamline it into slipstream it. Slipstream it into the distro. Yeah. Into the actual repos. And it's only going to be certain permitted applications that way they can maintain stability. But you and I have just said for years that if you could take something like a long-term support edition, but stay current on the user space applications, That's a big keep deal. the OS solid, stable, unchanging, like you Super need for a workplace. Nice. I'm excited. Super nice. Because currently, I mean, come on, we all know how to do that. You know, if, if we're running, you know, you yeah. can run Ubuntu, you know, 804 right now and still run the latest yep, version yep. of a lot of the different stuff. But you end up having to add, you know, custom repositories or go to places like getdeb.net or yeah. different places that package it for you. And that works. And that works. But for most people, they're not going to know how to do that. They're not going to want to know how to do that. They need something like this. So that's mm-hmm. pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. Um. A few other changes like better touchscreen support, Chromium is the default browser on a netbook, uh, things like that. This is all still early development, but we just thought you know some of these features are are 
are not just like nice to have for the Linux desktop, but these are features that'd be nice to have on any desktop on any operating desktop. system. These are great. And since we're having such an open SUSE heavy episode, we thought we got to give uh, a little shout out to uh, the progress in 10.10 that we're seeing so far. Big progress. Need more information on the yeah. whole App Store thing. But uh, but otherwise, hey, this is this is looking pretty great. And a great write up. We've got the link over in our show notes by uh, Tech <laughs> Throb. I think this is the first story they've ever had in our lineup. So techthrob.com. Uh, tech- Throb. That's a, <laughs> that's a name right there. Yep. Tech Throb. I kind of get it. You, like it. Do you like it? I kind of do. Uh, kinda, I kind of throb for tech myself sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you? Yeah. You know what I'm throbbing for right now, Brian? Nope. A little open Sousa. Oh, good. So I think with all of that said, well, that's all the news Thank God. for this week. All right. All right, now that we're we're done talking about Ubuntu so much, it's time to it's time to spend about eighteen years talking about OpenSUSE. Wow, okay. we're not going to talk not not that long, but we've we've got a lot of stuff to cover here. Uh, we're going to be covering the OpenSUSE build service, uh, what it is, and why you absolutely care about it. Um, and then we're going to talk about OpenSUSE Studio a little, or SUSE Studio, not OpenSUSE Studio, uh, which is uh, basically a way for you to build kind of your own little custom distros based on OpenSUSE. That's cool. Um, and uh, to help with that, uh, we got uh, we got two of the SUSE dudes with us, uh, Will and James. Uh, why don't you, James, go ahead and tell everyone uh, who you are and uh, and why we should care. Okay. Hey, guys. Um, howdy, howdy. Thanks for having me on the show. So my name is James Tan. I'm a software engineer with Suzu Studio. So I've been working on Studio for the last, I don't know, two, three years. So ever since the project was started, um, I've been working on it. So oh, I, wow. I moved from Singapore, actually, over to Nuremberg, Germany. So I'm based in Suzu, which is, yeah. So are we talking right. to you from Germany right now? Yes, I am. I love the internet. Fantastic. And we've also got Will on the line. Will, uh, what do you do with the OpenSUSE project? Hi, well, uh, my name's Will Stevenson, and uh, I work here in Germany, uh, up down the hall from James. Oh, okay. And uh, I'm actually currently a member of the OpenSUSE Boosters team, which, which are charged with boosting and growing the OpenSUSE community. Um, but I've been at SUSE for five years now, I think. And uh, before that, I've been on the KDE team, on desktop teams, and various other things. Wow. All right. Nice. nice. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Um, you know, I think so. The, these two projects are ones that we don't hear a lot about in the general Linux press, and it weirds me out a little bit that we yeah. don't hear about these all that much, uh, considering how big they are in in scope. Um, Should we wrap our brains around the build service for a minute? What, yeah. Uh, could would you guys give me a quick uh, pitch of what the build service is exactly? Okay. Well, the build service is a it's a Two things. It's it's a web service. Um, you can see it as a website. You can see it as a command line tool, and it is a way for you, for broadly for you to build uh, Linux software packages. Okay. Uh, but it's it's quite a lot more than that. If what we did in SUSE, as we were opening up up in SUSE, we had to say more than ten years of internal tools for building a distribution, and we looked around and we saw that um, distributions were becoming more and more similar. Um, so we thought, well, the best way to make OpenSUSE really stand out is to share our tools, because we had what we thought were the best in the world tools for making a Linux distribution. Cool. Right. And that was actually presented as the OpenSUSE build service. Okay. Um, so this is essentially a collection of tools that you guys have always had in-house that you've streamlined now into something that the public can use? Yeah. I mean, the, essentially now, um, five years down the line, it's actually a total rewrite. Oh, but okay. the, the the basic architecture remains very similar to what SUSE was being built with in, say, well, 1998 or so. Hmm. Of course, it looked a lot prettier. Um, <laughs> we've yeah, it, uh, done a 2.0 release, and that's now got this Web 2.0 kind of front end on it there, you can see. Yeah, I, mean, I love yeah. the uh, web interface on it. I think it's one of the it slickest looks great. looking. I also, uh, he scrolled down there for a sec. It's got uh, this really neat little stat system on there that uh, I think is so neat. I, I love that little that little just like little little glimpse of how how things are going. I think that's really cool. Those stats are absolutely addictive. I mean, when we're doing a release or something, we're just sitting there running uh, running watch on the internal stats, uh, seeing those update every few minutes, and seeing how many gigabytes of packages we're putting out. Um, and those stats are available to all the projects as well, so they can use that as metrics, see how popular they are. That's really cool. That's awesome. It's that's great to be able to get data like that. Now, now so it's so really not just about packages. Um, it's packages, it's projects. Out of those packages and projects, you can create repositories for all your popular Linux distributions. And then you and guys right. hold the, you guys host the bandwidth for all of that and everything like that. 
Uh, we do, yeah. That's um, quite a significant, uh, significant drain in our server room in terms of our bandwidth. <laughs> I, w- I would gather as much. Yeah, I would think we so. Have, we have, I think, about 30 fairly large machines hosting the build service, and they run up to 200 VMs. That's Whoa. awesome. That is uh, awesome. Are there other distros running on there to build other packages, or does everything run on OpenSUSE? Um, no, if you build bit distro packages for other distributions, so you can build for for Red Hat, for the for the Rels, for the Fedoras, for the SUSE, for the Sles, Mandriva, Ubuntu, Debian, and all the Ubuntu variants, um, those are all run uh, natively there. Um, we set up a wow. VM. The VM is a completely naked VM. It's installed, and then the build is run natively using it's the distribution's native build tools. So, so you're getting the same out as you would be if you were sitting at home with your Debian box wow. or your Fedora wow. box and uh, heating up your bedroom. <laughs> so the so OpenSUSE cool. project is taking on the task of running a bunch of different distributions releases, then letting people submit their source code and building the packages and then hosting the resulting package and even... D- and even providing a repo. Yep, yeah. and uh, even if you want to um, to to then take those packages and make cool. an ISO out of it, make a distribution, make a um, make a. Sorry, I'm losing your audio there. Oh, we, okay. it's we got okay. You. We got you. Okay, so if you want to then take a uh, take make your own ISOs, make your live CD images, make an installable DVD image, even make a disk image um, of a re- pre-installed machine, you can do that too with it. That is so super cool. I mean, just to kind of reiterate on this, this is kind of one of the big things like uh, that we've talked about about what is wrong with Linux right now is is when a developer, a third party piece of software such as Firefox or whoever wants to uh, put their software out there, they have to sit down and repackage it for like 50 freaking well, isn't distributions. This, uh, isn't this kind of on a smaller scale what you do at your home office? Is absolutely. Run all these VMs? And, and this, really what I need to be doing is I need to be using something like this. Yeah. Because this would save but me But you've tried in the past and there has been some potential issues. But yeah, but I know there's been... Cha- yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. it's been a little while. And so basically you could take that project, have it built, and, and have it uh, packaged for you for all these Distri- different distributions and have that taken care of for you and even have a repo provided. That's just awesome. What's I mean, the what's the long-term benefit for uh, OpenSUSE in this? Because this just seems really expensive. It, it, honestly, yeah, it seems like you guys are just kind of like being uh, generous philanthropists and uh, just trying to give us free stuff. So what, what do you guys get out of this? What we get out of that is a really powerful community of really good developers. I mean, um, people who are building um, for open for on the build OpenSUSE build service are also going to be probably building for OpenSUSE. So we're going to oh. be building big uh, a big collection of, of packages, all the latest I stuff see. that's up there for OpenSUSE. Oh, I get it. You're being sneaky. You're trying to trick us into making software for OpenSUSE. Hey, that's okay. a good payoff, I okay, think. I see. That's a good trade. So the idea would be that well, because they're using your service, they're likely <laughs> going to check that OpenSUSE build box, and now OpenSUSE gets a version, so the OpenSUSE users benefit. Yeah, of course, if you really, if you, if you don't want to build stuff for OpenSUSE, you're free to just build it for whatever distributions you want. You can, uh, you can run the build service yourself. There's even a, a turnkey appliance that you can just run that in a VM on your own machine and build your own packages. Um, That's cool. Build your closed source stuff. Of course, OpenSUSE build service is there for open, open source software only. But um, there are a lot of uh, commercial developers running their own instances, um, Things like drivers getting built there. Um, Migo now, Linux Foundation, they're running their own instance of the build service yep. on their servers. That's great. That's way cool. That's a big name project to have uh, using the service. That's really cool. Yeah, and we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of development coming back from them. Um, they're investing in it. They've got guys working on it. It's great. Is that is that where some of the uh, uh, Migo and Memo uh, options came in the latest? OpenSUSE 11.3 because I noticed there was some um, specific mentions in there about supporting those that that form factor style device and I think was it Mamo that was listed in the feature set. It was a, there was a Migo review. It was of, Migo. Of, okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that be, is that enabled because of their use of the build service or is that totally unrelated? Um, the packages have been imported from a separate instance of the build service, okay. so, and there had to be quite a number of tweaks made for OpenSUSE, but um, they're closely related. Okay. And, and now what we're doing is we should have the ability fairly soon to um, take Amigo package, build it to run on OpenSUSE, or build it to run in the Amigo installation. Nice. Hmm. So, sounds- so desktop, mobile, both things, one set of source code, just upload it, and it all gets rebuilt. And all those dependent packages, anything else that change after you like change your Migos, glibc, or something, 
they uh, all get rebuilt after you. It's all fresh and it's all consistent. That's really neat. That's incredibly cool. Now, what I'm I'm really curious about is what are your guys' stats? And you guys don't have to disclose this uh, or, or whatnot if, if you don't know the information in front of you. But for what people are using uh, for each distro, like are, is it mostly building for OpenSUSE right now? Or do you guys know if it's like 10% for Ubuntu or, or Fedora or those sorts of things? Are people really using it for the cross-distro nature currently? Or is it still mostly OpenSUSE? I don't have the exact numbers on me. I understand that it's mostly OpenSUSE. There are some fairly large projects, um, some sub, some KDE sub projects, um, VLC. They're using the build service to build for all different distributions themselves. Nice. There um, was there, uh, uh, there was a question coming out of our chat room specifically about being able to use RPM spec files, upload those to the build service, and get Debian packages out like with Deb Build. Is that um, is that something that's doable? That's not currently doable at the moment. If you want to have both both DEBs and RPMs, you need a separate um, DEB control file and your okay. RPM spec file at the moment. Got it. But you say at the thing, moment, though. So, so, so the developers still still are still responsible for for getting their their packages ready to be to be built. It's just that the build service currently handles the building across multiple architectures for you. That's right. Um, it, it is aimed at two group user groups at the moment. There's the, the users who would just want to get the fresh stuff. We want to make them happy, of course. And the developer who knows how to package software. Got it. Mm-hmm. Um, where we'd like to go in future with that, we've got some prototype tools under development, which um, will you can just give them a table and they will spit out ah. um, spec files and Debian control files. That'd be awesome. I and want nice that. Is, yeah, you want if you, that. If you could provide that, that, that would be okay by me. Well, um, I don't know how much KDE development you do, but we have a tool that works very nicely for KDE and Qt software. Mm-hmm. It's called KDE OBS Generator. Google that one. Okay. Nice. Hey, I got to say, you guys are getting some love from our chat room. I think we've got a few fans of the build service. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a very, very cool project. I mean, what I mean, what I would love to see is I would love to see some of the major distros embrace this. I mean, I know that would... You know, not exactly be wonderful for your bandwidth bill, but uh, I would love to see, uh, you know, heck, uh, you know, uh, Ubuntu and, and, and the Fedora project and hell, even Mandriva. I would love to see these projects just embrace this and say, you know what? Here is one, one central location to make it. We're going to build all of our packages here. We're going to make it easy for everybody to get all of their software for whatever distro they want. So then picking your distro is just picking your distro. I, I'll and take the one same from software you. is always going to be available I'll take one from, up on you. from the repos. What if the distros maintain their own builds, their own packages, but wouldn't it be cool if a lot of the big name uh, projects that you know are the upstream projects themselves, the owners of the originating source code, wouldn't it be cool if they all use the open source of build service? You could go get their yeah. clean build version of their own app. Like right now in, on Ubuntu, I probably pretty much have vanilla Firefox. I don't really think there's probably that much change to it. But wouldn't it be nice if I knew I could go get Mozilla's Firefox? Right. And I know I can go to the Mozilla and I can go find the uh, Ubuntu dab, but it'd be really nice if other projects like that, whoa, those stats just updated in real time. Yeah. Well, that's cool. We're, we uh, on Brian's screen over here. He has the open build, open uh, open source of build service stats, and uh, I, I don't know what page. Oh, monitor. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Build that open monitor. That's and cool. You can you can go in there and just you know kind of geek out and watch the little little bar charts there. Now, before we shift gears, um, is there anything else we want to cover on the build service, or should we should we start talking about Seuss Studio? Well, no, let's hand over to James for a bit and let's let him tell you about what's new in the studio. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Let's dive into that. All righty. So, so James, so uh, let's let's give the the high level overview of what SUSE Studio is and is trying to accomplish here. Okay, guys. So, um, well, as you've heard, um, we'll describe the open source build service. Basically, that lets you build packages really quick and easily. Um, but what we do in Studio is we kind of bring it up a notch. So once you have the packages you want, you know, end of the day. It's really useful to have a system running that, right? So Studio kind of gives you the ability to create your own software appliances very oh. quickly and easily. So if you look at, well, you're looking at a website now, right? Yep, so yep, basically, yep. system Linux, you know, quick and easy. So what is an appliance, right? So an appliance is basically your operating system, which in, in this case, right, it's your OpenSUSE or your SUSE Linux Enterprise. Mm-hmm. So you have your operating system, you have your application, so whatever... Um, applications that you have from the official open source repositories, from the from the OBS or anywhere you can edit from, and then 
you add configuration. So these three things, your OS, your application, and your configuration file. So this gives you an appliance. So I see. This so this is creating a virtual machine. Right. So so we have two main types of appliances that we support. You have your physical appliances and you have your virtual appliances. Right. Right. So for physical appliances, right now we support various formats. Like you can create a, a live CD DVD. So you can create a, a kind of a media and then you know basically a customized open source distribution, if you oh. will, with your own packages, you know, whatever software you want. And then you can put this in a computer, you can put it up and it's gonna work. What I find um, fascinating is the concept of being able to roll your own distro isn't isn't too new. I don't know of any other. I'm you're you're having all of this done through a web interface, right? And then it, and then it just produces on the back end. It then creates it and produces a downloadable file for me. Yeah, exactly. That so, is so, so that's slick. The nice thing about Studio because you know actually if you use uh, Open Source Build Service, actually uh, he has Kiwi support. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Open Source Kiwi. No. Basically, Kiwi um, is is a big post script. So okay. It takes a XML file, you know, a bunch of configuration. And it's gonna spit out an image for you. So, so the studio is actually just a, a web front end for this. Okay. And the nice thing about it, that, you know, because it's a web application, you can be running your Macintosh, you can be running Windows, you can be sitting in right. an internet cafe somewhere. I could be on an iPad. Just, what? No. Wait, no. Right. <laughs> I could be on an iPad making a Linux distro. That's ridiculous. I, I actually do that on my iPad too. So, <laughs> so there are some limitations because, um, well, let, let me get on to that in a little bit. Okay. So I see some questions in the, the chat room. Actually. Yeah, yeah. So, Absolutely. So actually, I wasn't done with the, the output format. So, okay. So let me just you yeah, know, rewind. Yeah, finish that up. All right. So, so back to the physical format. So we have the live CD, live DVDs. Um, we also have the USB format. So okay. basically, this gives you a, a hot this image. You can take this image, you flash into a USB it, stick, right? and yeah, so you can do it to your hard drive. So you can preload the system, awesome. or you can put the same image on a USB stick, and then it's a live bootable USB stick. That's cool. So that's really cool. You also have the the virtual formats, of course. So you can create your VMware appliances. You can create Zen appliances, and yeah, all these different formats. And we're working really hard to add even more formats. So very soon, we're going to have support for Amazon EC2. So oh you can my build gosh. C2 appliances. And because it's all a web application, so you can just click deploy and it's gonna, you know, send it up to Amazon and it's gonna run immediately. You don't have to download anything. It's just gonna work. So cool. That is so, so very, nice. very cool. And uh, just to be clear, it doesn't so you can set what packages you want to use, and that's cool. Um but you can even you can even set like like there, you can personalize it with your own logos and backgrounds if you want. I mean that's it basically is is a full it's a it's distro customizer, a full distro builder, almost. I mean, and as an IT person, you don't know how often I just randomly need to fire up a really quick Linux VM. Yeah, and how often I've needed to really quickly have a bootable USB thumbstick, and I have to go through this process of getting an image file and all this stuff. I mean, this, you guys, for my day job, is going to make my life mucho better. Mucho better. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> And this is really these uh, Brian and I uh, over the last few episodes of season twelve have been talking a lot about how we think the next big thing in Linux distros is probably going to have to be things like this, this value added uh, beyond just the packages and the theme kind of a thing. And you guys are not just sort of uh, ahead, but I mean, you guys are like a quantum leap ahead of everybody else. I, mean, I know the other guys like Fedora has their uh, tool to spin a distro, but again, that's an inside the distro thing. I mean, the beauty of this, I, I literally could be at a client's network in a web browser and generate an image file. And and this is so much more usable than the other solutions that are out oh, there. Oh, supremely more usable. It's it's. I mean, heck. I mean, if you look at if you just go and look at the the screenshots or actually just walk through it, I mean, you've got everything from you know calculating live, you know what the actual space used on the disk is, you know whether or not it's going to fit onto a CD, exactly how many packages you're using. It gives you all the details you need as you're building it. Live, you don't have to do any calculations yourself. You don't have to figure anything out. Basically, you just get a version of of OpenSUSE that yeah. has what you want with the look and feel you want and everything else. And it's just point and click. It's it's retard easy. It's mm -hmm. it's kind of which which is amazing. It's 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 really really great. So people out there could do whatever they want if they wanted to put a gaming version of SUSE together. They really could with this, or a Jupiter Broadcasting exactly. Edition. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's really so, cool. So one really nice thing, uh, if I could add, is that, um, you know, 
we calculate the dependencies you need. So if you say I want an Apache web server, we're just going to pull in all the dependencies. For I see you. that. Yeah. So, so I don't have to yeah. know that Apache 2 needs Apache 2 dash pref, Apache 2 work, Apache 2 dash utils, all that kind of stuff. I just know I want Apache 2. Mm -hmm. And what and do you, have you guys you seen the, to... oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, so what you can do with Studio is you can, you know, you choose, you start from a base template. So you can, you know, choose from a server template or a desktop template. You select the software that you want, you know, you configure the appliance as you like. And then, you know, the really nice thing is that after you build it, you know, usually you have to download the whole thing, you know, fire up VMware or whatever to test it, right? So that, that takes a bit of time, mm -hmm. you know, because if you build a, a simple LAMP stack, for example, it's only, only going to take two minutes to right. build on to the studio. So we, we don't really want to spoil this experience by getting people to download it and then they have to install, you know, something to I test it. I love that. So we have this feature called test drive, and I see you're looking at it. So, yep. so basically, once it's done, you can just click on test drive, and it's going to boot up the appliance. It spins right up the image. The right. Oh so, my so gosh, that is just so nerd happy. I love this. NC client that's going to connect to our servers, so you don't have to download anything. You can just you know use it, test it. If you're missing a package, you just go back, you know, add the package, and boom. And then test go. drive it again. Mm -hmm. Holy. And, crud muffins, and, dude. And so awesome. how does that work if I choose, do you just happen to have a VM server or a Zen server or whatever whatever type I made? Or does it is it always a Zen server, on uh, a Zen image on the back end? How does that work exactly from a technical standpoint? Uh, we, we pretty much, yeah. So if you if you run um, a Zen server, we will actually use VMware KVM to, to wrap it in the background. Okay. And it's going to boot up and then we use VNC to connect to it. And if you go back to the, the test drive screen, we have a, a few more features on top of that. So one nice feature we have is the modified files, right? So so when you boot up a system, you know, can you can you change that? files on it. Oh, okay. Um, it's going to show you a list of the files that have changed from the time you have booted your appliance in its, to its current state. No kidding. So, so this is really nice if you say, I don't know, if you want to install an Oracle database, right, that has some proprietary Java installer, so which you can't, you know, maybe easily do in the, in the RPM section. So you can then run the installer here you know, in this right. little test drive environment. And then you can look at the exact files that have changed on the file system. And then you can s just choose, I want this file, I want that file, and add those changes back to the original appliance. Yeah. Oh, Any sure. plans and to generate revenue from this? Or do you <laughs> or do you, suppose you foresee it for now remaining a free service? Uh, the build service is a free service. It always will be a free service. It's been free software since the, the get-go, uh, awesome. unlike some other collaboration platforms we Ooh, could mention. Snaps! So and like it's, a, uh, uh, launch pad. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. I had a little launch pad. I just had a little launch pad. You did. You did. I okay. saw that. <laughs> Didn't say that. <laughs> um, so uh, it, oh, the build service itself and the Kiwi, the tools it's built on, they're always going to be open source. Um, you can grab the appliance now and install them. Um, I think cool. it, 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 to us, they actually enable us to, to make revenue further up the stack. But we believe in those tools being being free software. Very neat. Are you guys, that's inc incredibly cool. I mean, but it just seems like so. This seems like the kind of thing. I mean, where I would go up here and I'd end up creating a couple of different images and toying around with all sorts of different things for a couple different clients, and you know, one just for me, and then one with the Jupiter Broadcasting logos on it, just because I can. Uh, and I'm gonna end up eating up about you know 30 gigs of your guys's hard drive space. It just seems like it's taking up so much resources to offer such a free service. I mean. How how on earth can you guys do that? It just it it boggles my mind. Boggles theirs too. It sounds yeah, like. all right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got some, um, I, I can't comment on what actually powers the studio. James can maybe tell you about that. But we got some fairly hefty um, equipment sponsors. Um, if you look on the uh, OpenSUSE Build Service oh, okay. homepage, okay, that, good. Uh, keep us. Um, keep us in hardware um but it is a, a serious drain and we've actually thinking about moving that out into a separate uh, location because it, we've actually uh, um over uh, demanded what the german u electricity utilities can <laughs> apply to our building <laughs> wow uh, good guys uh, yeah the uh, the main the main electricity failed and about a second later the secondary uh, independent electricity supply also blew like a 10 foot deep hole in the pavement outside the office so <laughs> whoa serious power draw yeah, there's a lot of work going oh. through that building. Oh, I love that. That is fantastic. Now, see, honestly, 
That's the sort of new sort of news story you guys need to put out there. The uh, OpenSUSE build service and SUSE Studio blows a ten foot hole into the pavement outside of your thing, but because of the power. I want to see pictures of this. That right well, there is a news grabber. For that, um, the, the studio site actually is, is running a data center in Waltham. So it's actually just the build service alone that's blowing up the powers. One of the uh, one of the last things I wanted to ask you that I noticed about the build service that I didn't quite understand, but I think I get it. I just want to clarify is I noticed that also there's like pre-assembled community versions of packages that you could roll into your own distro. So like there's a KDE4 reloaded, GNOME reloaded. Um, there's even there's even featured appliances that I could even go grab myself that somebody else yeah. already built. Is, am I am I following that? Right. So actually, that's something I wanted to. Uh, add on as well. So what you have just uh, what you're looking at now is actually what we call the studio or uh, the Sousa Gallery. Yeah. So this is one of the the new things that we're, we're actually going to have a, a big launch um, later this week. Just to give you a sneak peek. Oh, nice. So on Tuesday we're celebrating the one year anniversary of Sousa Studio. Congrats. So, you know, on, on so on Tuesday we will have a, a pretty big announcement. So you see some press release about um, Sousa Studio and Sousa Gallery. Right. Uh, nice. So there'll be some changes to this website. So so keep watching. Those this are page. coming. I saw that on your blog. Right. So Very cool. so the, the blog has some details. But yeah. basically, you know, Studio gives you the ability to create your appliances. But what was missing was a way to kind of share this, you know, appliance with the, the community and for people who who may not want to actually create content, but you know, if they just want a, a, a server or a desktop they can use, they can just go to gallery and just grab an image. So yeah. you can... Numbers. I've got some great numbers here for go you. Go for it. Uh, Lay it on us. Uh, James, if I may, uh, on Studio, um, when I looked on Friday on Studio, you have um, 77,214 users. That was Friday at 6 o'clock. Congrats. Um, you have uh, 226,070 appliances being built there. What? And they've built um, 416,000 times. Um, since it was rebooted. <laughs> Whoa. Since it was rebooted. <laughs> right. And Will, is there anything you want to touch on? Yeah, I've got two news items for you. Um, firstly, coming up in October, we have the OpenSUSE conference, our second edition of nice. the uh, conference, all about the community and the distribution and all the people around it. Um, that is from October 20th to 23rd in Nuremberg in Germany. Okay. Oh, um, that's too far to drive. While we're on the subject of working, um, I'd like to point out that we are actually looking for another engineer on the OpenSUSE build service. So if, uh, if what stirs your tea is packaging, if it's Perl, if it is Ruby, if it is Python, then uh, think about coming to work for us here in Nuremberg. Did did you just say if what stirs your tea? Was that was that the the phrase you just said? I think that's a first. <laughs> I am an Englishman. Uh, now is if that is that a? Uh, yeah, I hadn't heard that one. That's great. Is that an in the office position or is that a remote work position? Um, I think we could be flexible for the right candidate. Or who All should right. they who should they contact if uh, they think they might be the right person? If you go to build.opensuse.org, there are links to the um, extremely complicated careers URL. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, guys. Yeah, it's been great talking to you. On the show. All right. Well, hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Okay. I, I'm pretty confident at this point that this wraps the show Feels up. Feels solid, this, Brian. This, this concludes the entire season right there. Big show. We, we started the season with this episode. Boom, we're at this episode. I like that. That's like, the way we went. Like ten weeks later. I was I was actually boom, boom. just I was gonna try and talk about like what we were talking about back then. Can't remember. Oh, I think I remember. <laughs> what uh, would we start it uh, Google declares war on Apple might have been the first episode of the new season. I don't remember though. I can't remember. I'll have to check it. But I might be right on that. I, I barely remember that topic. Yeah. 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 That, uh, that was years ago now. So uh, that wraps up this episode. At this point in the shooting, we don't know if this has been a two part show or a one part show. Yeah. It depends on how long the interview went. Uh, we're going to try and squeeze it all into one, uh, but we'll, we'll find out. If, if it's not, we'll tell you and you'll get the second part later. Yeah. How about that right there? I huh? like that. That's pretty good stuff. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, if you want to get a hold of us, there's Twitter. Yeah. There's Brian Lunduke and Chris LAS. Yep. There's Facebook, just Jupiter Broadcasting. Boom. On the Facebook. Yeah, it's fantastic. There's the Jupiter Colony. Colony yeah. Forum. Fantastic. Good stuff. There you have it. All right, everyone. Well, we'll be back next Sunday with an all new episode of. An all new season. An all new season. What do we bring you next season, Chris? Mm. What, what, do you, what do you think we're going to lay into people's eyes and ears next season? We'd love to take suggestions, too. So let us know over Jupiter Who knows? Colony. What will the theme be? Will there be a theme, or will we we'll just go by the seat of our pants? We'll cowboy it. Who knows? I have a feeling which direction it's going to go. Tune in to find out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Oh. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for watching or listening to this episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you next week in season 13. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs>